Tonight, we'll begin an examination of a house still divided. It's a study of race relations in Memphis. It's an issue that affects each and every one of us, and one that touches so many other issues, ranging from crime to education. Here are Bob Allen and Esme Murphy, who've been working on this series. Jerry, our purpose is to find where Memphis stands on the issue of race relations and where we are headed and what might be done to improve our future. We have talked to people who are well known, but mostly we have sought out those who are not in the public eye. Tonight we begin with an examination of attitudes. How is it that we as blacks and whites feel about each other? Seven minutes before seven, six fifty-three and sun coming up. It'll be a nice day today. In the early morning, as coffee is poured, people in the Mid-South begin their days. For most blacks and whites, those days begin separately, in different neighborhoods, in different parts of town. Later, black and white paths will likely cross in the workplace or perhaps in a shopping area. But while paths may cross, in many cases, they never meet. What do you think about the progress of race relations in the city of Memphis? They stopped in 1960. Minority, minority. But that minority ain't worth a dime. The movement that gave black Americans the legal right to an equal share in American life has left many white mid-southerners feeling they are now the ones who are discriminated against. To get a job, you have to be black. To get any kind of aid, any kind of help, any kind of support, you have to be black. The only minority left is the white man. I think everybody else is doing everything they can for, for blacks, for women, for people who were previously considered minorities and they've completely left out the white male. Most blacks we spoke with disagree. We do have a long way to go because um, things still are equal. We're losing more, more of what we gain slowly every day. You know. We found the levels of resentment have a lot to do with how barriers have fallen. In neighborhoods like Midtown, where blacks and whites both choose to live, we found far less resentment than communities like Frazier and Whitehaven, where busing forced the races together. When I look back and I think what all I had to give up for, you know, for the kids to be put in a different school, private school, with a school only two blocks away from us, it, it just, it left me kind of bitter. Bitter towards blacks? D toward blacks, toward the system. But for every expression of resentment, no we also police. found one of progress. Uh, when a white policemen walk down the street, blacks were obligated to almost drop their heads. Uh, when you couldn't use the restroom, the water fountain. So obviously, we've come so far from that. I have a dream. My poor little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I but while there has been progress, Benjamin Hooks and many other blacks and whites say it falls far short of Martin Luther King's dream. Because it is here in Memphis that King was assassinated, many blacks and whites feel we have a special responsibility to fulfill that dream. But there are others who feel that because this city is the site of his death, we are more harshly criticized when it comes to the issue of race. Yet many people we spoke with who have lived, worked, and traveled to other communities say we compare favorably. I think Southerners have a greater capacity to be more tolerant, to be more respectful of the differences of people. As a matter of fact, putting the numbers aside, I think we're a lot better. The racial climate in Memphis is about as good as it is in any other city, and I've lived in about five or six large metropolitan areas in the country. But for every indication that the races here are getting along better, there are other indications that things are getting worse. Whites are continuing to flee to the suburbs. 30 years ago, Memphis was 37% black. Now it is 55% black. The Memphis City Council is often split along racial lines. And while the population of the Mid-South is fairly even, most of our children go to schools that are predominantly white or black. Memphis State professor and political consultant John Bakke says if the trend continues, every one of us will suffer. So we might have uh, affluent neighborhoods and maybe malls and shopping centers on the edges of the county. But as far as having a community with the arts and 
education, professional sports, and recreation, and so on, uh, did not uh, do anything for the quality of life of the entire area. This economic division that John Bakke speaks of is not encouraging, but it's one that is at the heart of race relations in this community. Bob, as well, you mentioned the attitudes of race often have to do with how much the races are forced together. For example, you mentioned busing, Esme. Have you found a bitter bitterness? And, and if so, how, how widespread is that bitterness? I think it's really quite widespread. Busing has dropped dramatically in Memphis in the Mid-South in the past 14 years. Yet those people who were affected by that original court order 14 years ago remain deeply embittered today. What is the next segment going to be about tomorrow? Uh, Claudia, tomorrow we'll talk about economic opportunities. We'll talk about the economic direction that Memphis is heading in and how it impacts on race relations. All right. Bob Esme, thank you very much. have announced plans to do what they can in the months and years ahead to open more economic doors to blacks. Tonight, in part two of our series, A House Still Divided, Bob Allen is here with an in-depth look at economic opportunities for blacks and how they affect race relations. Bob? Well, Jerry, over the last 20 years, Memphis has become a major urban center with a bright future. But what happens in the future depends a great deal on the economic progress of over 50 percent of the population. Now, one of the problems we face is a faltering national economy brought on by plant closings and foreign competition. If America is to remain a first-class nation, she can no longer have second-class citizens. In 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. came to Memphis to lead black sanitation workers in a protest for higher wages. Those workers were earning near minimum wage and were caught in the cycle of poverty. It's been 19 years since Dr. King's assassination, and some feel that economic progress has been slow for blacks. I have experienced a lot of racism on my previous job mm -hmm. as far as working out by me being the only black on the floor. You know, others are suffering and don't have the exact same freedom and the exact same opportunity for advancement in the cities. Like other cities, Memphis has its share of wealth, but some residents have so much and others have very little. A drive through city neighborhoods shows a difference in living conditions. And U.S. Census Bureau statistics show a difference in earnings. The median income for the average black family in Shelby County is $13,000 a year, compared to $28,000 a year for an average white family. 
120,000 blacks receive food stamps, and 45% of black children live below the poverty level. The rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, and that is an attitude that has been fostered by this administration. NAACP Executive Director Benjamin Hooks and Memphis State Economist Dr. Kurt Flexner say a nationwide decline in economic conditions is taking a toll on Memphis. Plant closings, ATT, IBM, General Motors, Exxon, the Bellwether Companies of America are, are, are closing down factories, phasing out workers. Blue-collar workers, both black and white, are literally frightened to death in this country. This has been replaced by tourism and, uh, and uh, the service industries and distribution, which are low-paying jobs for the most part. And that's taking place in the country as a whole, but especially in Memphis. So the pie has really shrunk, not grown. It shrunk. Now, when the pie shrinks, racial discrimination cannot become better. When Firestone and International Harvester closed their Memphis plants, thousands of whites also joined the ranks of the unemployed. As a result, more and more whites are now entering job training programs that were previously dominated by blacks. The Urban League Computer Training Center has been a source of hope for blacks and whites who are considered hardcore unemployed. I know that I'm going to receive quality training and I'm going to better myself and I'll be able to present to an employer what I hope and what I'm sure you'll be looking for. Because of educational opportunities, many blacks have achieved success in today's tight economy. Dr. Sharon Harrell owns and operates a pharmacy in Memphis. A lot of people, when they come in here, they think I'm managing the store for somebody else. Dr. Harrell had a good business plan and financing, but other black entrepreneurs aren't so lucky. You run into a severe problem of getting the banks to even look at your package if you intend to locate in the, in the black community. There's a real sense of urgency and, it, and an attentiveness from the white business community to get involved. Tanner George and Bill Craddock believe the black and white business community will have to work together because they say it's vital to the future of Memphis. Tanner George says the Black Business Association is developing a plan for self-help. Now under that plan, a number of white businessmen have agreed to help new and existing minority businessmen improve overall business skills. It's hoped that more successful black businesses will create more jobs within the black community. Jerry? Bob, besides the goals for Memphis, what are some of the other organizations that have committed themselves to helping black economic development in the city? Uh, Jerry, the uh, Memphis Area Chamber of Commerce outlined as its top goal for 1987 uh, its plans to also boost minority mm -hmm. business, and that commitment is also shared by Goals for Memphis, the City Center, co the Center City Commission, and the Shelby County uh, government as well. So the ball seems to be picking up momentum and rolling a little right. bit. Right, yeah, yes. What, what aspect of race relations does uh, part three tomorrow evening focus Well, tomorrow on? Esme Murphy will look at the issue of teen pregnancy. Which affects all uh, of us. A lot too. of people. Right. right. It's, extended it's a major problem. Thank you, Bob. Claudia. One of the biggest problems facing both black and white families is the radical changes in our lifestyles. These changes tend to fall most sharply on our young people. In our series, A House Still Divided, Esme Murphy has been looking into one of these changes, the increasing rate of teen pregnancy. Esme? Claudia, teen pregnancy is, is a problem faced by both blacks and whites. It's also a problem that enhances some of the differences between the races. Wake up, John. Wake up. It's time to put your clothes on. It is just 6 o'clock and 17-year-old oh, Cheryl Gaston go, is already up. Cheryl has to get ready for school and she has to get six-week-old Jonathan ready to go to the babysitter. The juggling act of being a high school senior and an unmarried mother is more than she bargained for. I have to get up in about twice or three times out of the night to get up and feed him. I have to warm his bottle and wait till it warms and then feed is a whole lot of work, a lot of responsibility. Cheryl is one of the roughly 900 unmarried teens who had a baby in Shelby County in 1986. Roughly 90% of those unmarried teens are black. White teens are also getting pregnant, but a higher percentage are choosing abortions. Roughly 85% of local white teen pregnancies end in abortions. The figure for black teen abortions is much lower at 37%. Experts blame society. I think it's everybody's problem. I think we're living in a, a society that's actually explicit. Um, 
media magazines. The different way blacks and whites choose to deal with this problem helps to enhance the economic and social differences between the races. Experts say that the unwed teen who chooses to keep her baby is committing herself not only to motherhood, but to a life of financial difficulty. Eighty percent of those teens who have babies do not finish high school, making it impossible for them to compete for top jobs. And 25 percent of teen mothers have a second baby within a year. Civil rights leaders like Benjamin Hooks say the high number of blacks having babies contributes to racism. Among whites, we found a widespread feeling that many teens choose to get pregnant to get government benefits. I've heard the blacks say, well, I'm not taking those pills. Uh, if I have another child, that means $34 more a month in welfare. But counselors disagree. They say most young girls think they will never get pregnant. And those that do want children simply want something that belongs to them. And they think this is mine. I can call this person mine. And it'll love me like I love it. But the reality is that the child takes control of their lives and their dreams. This is a group session for Project RAP, a program aimed at helping teen mothers. Before I got pregnant, I was wanting to um, go to school and get out and go to college and be a registered nurse. But now I understand that I have to be around when he needs me. It doesn't mean that you will never be a registered nurse, because if that's something you really want, there are ways that you can do that and still have a child, and that's a very important thing to know. This group session for Project RAP is one of the reasons this state-funded program has been successful in keeping its young women in high school. The program is a year old, and to date, none of these teenagers have had a second child. The group hopes to expand into junior high and high schools to reach other teens before they get pregnant. Other possible solutions experts point to are school-based clinics like this one at Booker T. Washington High in Memphis. While it does not dispense birth control, it does offer family planning counseling. But most experts say that it is up to all of us, who know teenagers, to provide them with support and the information they need to cope with a society that is becoming increasingly fast-paced. This problem shows no sign of getting better. Local experts say the teen pregnancy rates for both blacks and whites has been rising every year through the 70s and the 80s. Now, as may I say, figures show that more white teens abort as opposed to black teens having their babies. Why is this? Two apparent reasons. The first, economic. Since black teens on the whole are poor, they cannot afford the abortions that white teens are getting. The second reason, according to a DHS counselor, is that within the black family there has always been the commitment by grandparents, aunts and uncles, to take care of another child. Apparently this commitment continues to this day. These figures are astounding. What's in store for us tomorrow in tomorrow's segment? Well, tomorrow Bob Allen will look at how crime affects racial attitudes here in Memphis. All right. Thank you very much. Tonight, Bob Allen takes a look at crime and how it affects race relations in the fourth segment of our series, A House Still Divided. Bob? Claudia, police say a major cause of crime in the, is, why it, is the widespread use, abuse of drugs and alcohol. They say the problem is so serious, it's destroying the future of our uh, community. Okay. There we go, gentlemen. Pretty blue. Field tested right positive. positive. That is good cocaine. This cocaine bust is a common scene in a neighborhood where drugs are flourishing. That's a couple of drug dealers going there, too, and they live right. A couple of them live over there, those two there, you know. So, mm -hmm. But if the guy's not doing anything, you can't arrest him. With very few jobs and opportunities, many young blacks are turning to cocaine to earn a fast dollar. Police say they don't have the manpower to keep up with every small-time dealer. And they know every nook and cranny in this place where to run. There's apartments down here that they know that they can run into and hide. That around the corner, run into an apartment. We get around the corner, we don't see them. And a lot of them go to school. See, so they go to junior high school and high school, and then, you know they'll Next go to school schools. and they have the beepers in school with them. Schools. Vocational schools, they don't care. You know, if they're in the classroom taking a test or something, the beeper go off. That means hey, he got to go make a pickup or buy. You know? Violence occasionally accompanies drug deals. Officer Young points out a number of spent shotgun shells from previous shootouts. Everybody around to throw pistols, all the cocaine drug dealers. So, you know, a guy get mad at somebody about something, well, first thing he's going to do is put his pistol out and you got to shoot. Shelby County Sheriff Jack Owen says this is an example of why the elimination of drugs is one of his top priorities. It is of such urgency that uh, we have to move in an effort to counter 
the threat to uh, the youngsters and to the uh, neighborhoods and to working people as well. The apparent rise in crime is a major cause of fear and suspicion between the races. In the downtown area, I'd be a little bit nervous about that. Crime is getting, I think, a little scary. Um, I know I'm hesitant now to go out at night. Crime is a threat in most neighborhoods, but it poses the greatest danger to the black community. Of the record 170 murders in Memphis last year, 118 involved blacks killing other blacks. All rise. General Sessions Judge Bernice Donald presides over 9,000 cases a year in her courtroom, and many are black-on-black -black crimes. The Judge Donald Judge says Bernie's that in many cases, people who have no control over their lives let their emotions take hold and react violently. Given an opportunity to look back, individuals will oftentimes admit, well, that was senseless. But at the time, emotions, frustrations, and all of that gets in the way, and they have an inability to reason. But who are the people committing crimes, and what led them down that path? Inmates at the Shelby County Jail gave a variety of reasons. At the time of my crime, I can't initially say that I was under the influence of drugs, but it was all drug-related. So I quit school to try to get a job. So I couldn't get no job to try to go back to school, so they wouldn't enroll me back in school. So I ended up going to the juvenile, and from there, he on up on the road. The Shelby County Jail is predominantly black and badly overcrowded. Some people want bigger prisons, but the people there say we need to improve rehabilitation. Instead of this building warehouses and, 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 and this, what we say, this throwing them in there, uh, chucking them in there, have a, and give them a certain length of time and put them back out in the street, then there's no rehabilitation there. Your life is affected by crime, directly or indirectly. For that reason, crime is not a black or white issue. It's a problem the entire community will have to deal with. Police say there will always be people who pursue a life of crime, but in some cases, people who can be rehabilitated don't receive treatment for their drug problem and are often released back into the same environment with no job or alternative but to keep committing crimes. Bob, you mentioned that drug use and abuse is flourishing in certain neighborhoods. What can the people living there do to fight that? Well, Claudia, all too often, people say they can identify the uh, drug dealers, but they're afraid to identify them because uh, they're, they fear retaliation. And they say they have to live in these neighborhoods, and the police can't provide them 24-hour protection. It's a catch-22. Exactly. What's happening tomorrow? Tomorrow, Esme Murphy will take a look at housing and neighborhoods. Oh, a man's home you, is said to be his castle, but are our castles fortresses against those of the opposite race? Tonight, in part five of our series on race relations, Esme Murphy examines the issue of race and neighborhoods. Esme? Well, Jerry, when we went out into communities, what we found were two distinct trends. The first trend is that neighborhoods across the Mid-South are slowly becoming integrated. The second trend is that many whites are leaving those integrated neighborhoods. Home is where the heart is, and where are our hearts on this issue of living side by side? The neighbors won't sell to blacks. They just, they just will not sell the homes to blacks. And uh, no white wants to live out here because there's blacks moving in. In communities like Fraser and Whitehaven in Memphis, blacks are moving into areas that were once all white, and there are fears that a way of life is ending. We had a pretty good community, and they come in there with that. Knocked the, down, it knocked the value of the property down just like that. You mean when the blacks moved in? That's right. These are the feelings that are fueling white flight from urban areas. It began when busing started. From the turn of the century to 1970, a census taker showed a steady increase in Memphis white population. Then in 1972 came court-ordered busing. The 1980 census showed an 8% drop in white population. The busing of Memphis City School students has dropped dramatically, but white flight continues. The 1987 projection show there will be fewer whites here than there were in 1960. As whites leave, blacks are taking their place. Wherever there's a house for sale, they move in. I like this house up here. If it's for sale, people moved out of there and it's sold colored. No, 
For the most part, blacks we spoke with say that moving into a white neighborhood has been easy. But the only thing I can tell you is on this street, we haven't had any trouble whatsoever. Both of my neighbors are white, so I don't have any problems with them, none, so whatever. Many whites in integrated neighborhoods agree. We live in South Haven, and uh, we do have, you know, mixed races over there, and... Uh, I think things have gone real well. Realtors say that it is now the color green that counts when it comes to housing, and that even in the havens of white flight, blacks are moving in. You have blacks living in East Memphis, you have blacks living in Germantown. Um, a black person can live anywhere they can afford to buy a home. So there are two trends, white flight and the slow integration of our neighborhoods. Which trend will win out? Memphis State professor and political consultant John Bakke sees white flight continuing, and he says with it will come a decline in our overall quality of life. So we might have uh, affluent neighborhoods, but as far as having a community with the arts and education, and professional sports and recreation and so on, uh, it will not uh, do anything for the quality of life of the entire area. But Reverend Don Payton, the director of the Center for Neighborhoods, disagrees. His center, which is part government funded and part privately funded, helps organize and bring together neighborhood groups from across the city. Payton thinks the trend towards desegregation is winning out. In fact, Memphis is on the upswing in terms of improved communications among the various ethnic groups in Memphis and Shelby County, Memphis is moving in a positive direction, not a negative direction. What the experts do agree on is that the next few years will be critical in determining whether we will live in a community of mostly white suburbs in a black inner city, or whether we will live in a truly integrated community. Now, Esme, in some northern cities, there's been a significant trend of whites moving back into the city. Apparently that, at least not yet, is happening here. Well, many experts feel that it could very well happen here in 10 years' time. Whites have moved back in northern cities simply to take advantage of some tax breaks that have been provided by the city. We have not been provided those tax breaks. And also because of the advantages of city life, the beautiful homes, that older homes that exist here. A lot of people feel that eventually, 10 years from now, that trend will take place. In any event, it's a long-term process. It is a long-term process. We are a little behind in this trend compared to some northern cities. The series will continue next week. What is Monday night segment going to deal with? Uh, Monday night, Bob Allen will take a look at race, race and religion and how religion can bring us together in this matter. All right, thanks very much, sure. Esme. Claudia? Memphis has been called the city of churches. Situated firmly in the Bible Belt, there's no doubt that religion has played a key role in the city's development. Bob Allen is here with tonight's installment of A House Still Divided, in which he talks with several church leaders who give their perception of religious roles, of religion's role in race relations. Bob? Well, since slavery, it's been said that blacks wouldn't have a prayer without the church. Not only is it a place of worship, it's also a major source of black leadership. Since the early days of the civil rights movement, Black ministers have used the church to influence and bring about social changes. Somebody had to touch something within the individual. That, that role the church had of inspiring people to march when they had no weapons and no protection, to march against uh, fire hoses and, 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 and mad dogs, whether they were two-legged or four-legged. But for white Southern Baptist ministers, the church has served one purpose. My major objective is to preach the gospel and to bring people to Christ, to bring them to a saving knowledge of Jesus, and uh, anything else that we do would be uh, sublimated to that chief mission. Reverend Samuel B. Kiles is pastor of Monumental Baptist Church and director of Operation PUSH. Dr. Adrian Rogers is minister of Bellevue Baptist Church, the largest Baptist church in Memphis, and president of the Southern Baptist Convention. Reverend Cowell says Southern Baptists have for years ignored controversial issues like race relations. It's issues that are safe, you know, that, 
that the majority population can deal with. Prayer in the school. Yeah, well, you know, praying in the school and the same praying in the school will not permit you to write your congressman and say, stop cutting out these programs of Medicaid or feeding programs. And conversely, there's some who select their issues and there's some who just play it safe and don't deal with issues. But again, I want to uh, say that the major issue of every church ought to be to preach and teach Jesus Christ. When Memphis schools were integrated, a number of churches established private academies. Reverend Cowles says this has undermined Memphis public schools. If the pastors of white churches in Memphis would have said, this is the law, parishioners, members, we are law-abiding citizens. They didn't pick up uh, knives and guns and clubs, but they did convert their educational buildings into private academies. Doubtless there were some academies that were begun uh, with a purely uh, racist motivation or and a lot of those I don't think the people were at their heart racist I think some of them were due to fear and prejudice that comes out of ignorance and uh, I think uh, by and large those uh, schools have gone by the board I think there were others who were motivated uh, by a desire for education and, and specifically Christian education Another highly respected religious leader in Memphis was Bishop Carol Dozier. Before he died in 1985, Bishop Dozier was an outspoken champion for civil rights and equality. The new bishop-elect of the Catholic Diocese of Memphis is also deeply committed to ending racism. When I look back over the last 25 years, we have moved. And therefore, I'm not fatalistic and hopeless about it. I do have hope. But I also am realistic enough to know that it's a long, hard walk. Bishop-elect Beekline says the only way to overcome the challenge of racism, poverty, and unemployment is to improve communication between people. What does the bishop-elect, Bob, say he plans to do about the social problems that he sees here? Well, Jerry, the bishop-elect has just arrived in town and will be installed next month, he says. Give him a little time and he'll have a plan. Got to get his feet on the ground a little bit. That's right. How about tomorrow night's segment, Bob? Uh, tomorrow night, Esme Murphy will look at schools and education. All right. When it comes Thanks to race much. relations, no other issue has been more important and more difficult than education. A landmark Supreme Court decision in 1954 was not enough to desegregate schools. In the 1970s, children across the country were ordered bust out of their neighborhoods. Esme Murphy has been looking into the legacy of busing and the impact on our schools, Esme. Well, Claudia, nearly 15 years after court-ordered busing, most of our children still go to schools that are nearly all black or nearly all white. No other issue has so divided our community, for busing brought the issue of race relations home to all of us. On the walls of Whitehaven High School are pictures of youth and a changing society. This is the class of 1986. And this is the class of 1972, the last class to graduate from here before court-ordered busing. In the years after the court order, parents pulled 30,000 white children out of public schools. One of those children belonged to beautician Brenda Webb. Did you not want her to be the only white girl in, in this? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It sure was. Um, I was just, I was glad that I could afford to. I know there's been a lot of people that couldn't afford to send their child to private school, and I just feel fortunate that I was able to. Since the mid-70s, more whites have left. Those who have stayed are often criticized. What do your parents, friends, or maybe some of your other friends, what do they say when they find out that you go to Whitehaven? Don't you hate going to Whitehaven with all those black people? I kind of just blow it off to the side because it really has no effect on me. Those that have stayed see relations improving. I've noticed lately, like, even the parties are just half and half. I mean, they used to be white. In the sophomore year, there were white parties and black parties. Now they're parties together. Well, we all go around in cliques, but they're, all, they're interracial, interracial relationships. But the whites who have stayed are the exceptions to a trend. Since busing, Memphis white population has taken a nosedive. This kind of uh, mig migratory pattern is not peculiar to Memphis alone. It's happening all over America. The cities are getting blacker. 
People have avoided the threat of having their children bus to a different part of town by moving to new towns. And while some students have been lured back to public schools, many others are entrenched in their private schools. At the private academies that started as a result of busing, a generation too young to remember the court order says faith is their reason for coming here. I like the atmosphere better at Skyview because it's a... I'm going, uh, Skyview's a Christian school, so I think maybe for me it's a better atmosphere. We found that students in mostly white or mostly black environments are wondering what the other world is really like. I think maybe uh, a little is lost in the fact that you don't experience having friendships, friends that are of another ethnic group. I realize the outside world is mostly white, and I sometimes worry about whether I'll be able to adapt to a real society. And in this sense, educators warn that our children's education is suffering. I think for a person to be broadly educated, they must understand the diversity of people. And uh, in my own view, I think many of the boys and girls who are in uh, schools that are one race, whether they are black or white, uh, boys and girls who are in schools where there's one class, uh, I think they're missing out on a well-rounded education. For those who fought for the integration of public schools, the present situation is upsetting. It appears the effort to desegregate schools in some ways has deepened divisions in our community. Esme, what does the trend show for the future? Well, the trend shows this policy of having white schools and largely black schools continuing simply because we have a declining white population in the city and also a declining black population in the county. So if you've got separate communities with different populations, you're obviously going to still have separate schools. What can we look forward to tomorrow? Okay, tomorrow Bob Allen will be looking at social life in Memphis. All right, look forward to it. Thank you, Esme. Blacks and whites in Memphis spend a lot of time together in the workplace, but what do we do at 5 o'clock when the workday ends and the nightlife begins? Tonight in our series, A House Still Divided, Bob Allen is here to tell us about socializing and how blacks and whites go their separate ways after work. Bob? Well, Claudia, if there's one thing Memphians have in common, it's the fact that we all like to have a good time after a hard day's work. Now, while there are events and places that bring the races together, it seems the races are still more comfortable when they're not together. The twinkling lights illuminate a growing, vibrant city. But darkness hides the fact that it's two cities. If you used to go to like a place like in Cahoots or um, TGI Fridays, when you're there, you in the crowd, you miss white people, but it's like you're outside. They don't like welcome you in. It's like you're on the outside looking in. This is only a sampling of two popular Memphis clubs. But if you listen closely, it's hard to tell the difference in the music. Whites agree that times have changed, but some say we still have a long way to go. Everybody's not real comfortable with it right now here in Memphis. It's taken time to get to this point. It's going to take a little bit more time for the majority of people to be comfortable with it. I don't think you have a majority of people in the area that are totally comfortable with it, but it's a heck of a lot more than it was several years ago. It's not the big thing it was. You know, they got it out of the public's eye. As long as they keep it out of the public, it'll, it'll, it'll go right in. But some blacks believe the city would be better off if the races came together more often. I understand that sometimes light tend to stay together with light. That is to say, when blacks are with blacks and whites are with whites, they may feel that they can be more of at ease and say what they want to say. But there has to be a time I think we socialize because we can socialize together, we can do other things together, and we can try to help deal with this whole race, uh, racial situation that's redeveloping. Uh, in this country. You know, we live in the same city, uh, we work together, so why not play together? If there's one uniting force in this city, it's Memphis State basketball. Every home game, a predominantly white crowd of 10,000 people come to root for their Tigers. They seem to play together and play very well together. Throughout his career, Coach Larry Finch has been a champion for change. 
He's one of the first black players recruited at Memphis State. Now he's the school's first black coach. You start thinking about athletics. Usually race relation, uh, racial problems never really creep uh, into it. Because people look at him as a basketball player or whatever first. Never really get into that detail of him being black or white or whatever. And, and that's great to a certain extent. I just wish the people in society would look at uh, a person uh, according to who they are and, and not just because of the color of the skin. Now, Coach Fence says his formula for success is simple. All you have to do is treat others as you would like to be treated. Claudia? Sounds like a good philosophy. Tell me about what are some of the instances where the races do come together? I would say uh, events where the general public is invited, like uh, Memphis in May, uh, Tom Lee Park, the musical events down there, and down on Bill Street. Where the public, general public is invited. Right, right. What's going on for tomorrow? Well, tomorrow, Esme Murphy will look at politics and power. Sounds politics interesting. It can be an Thank avenue you, of change or division. And in recent years in Memphis, it seems that when politics and race have gotten intertwined, the road has been one of division. As part of our series, A House Still Divided, Esme Murphy has been looking into this issue of politics and race. Esme? Well, Jerry, it's said that politics often makes strange bedfellows, but too often in local politics, when race is a factor, it seems that enemies, not bedfellows, are being made. I don't think any black in this city is looking for a handout. Only thing we ask for is fairness. And uh, again, I think the mayor has to set the proper tone. He is the contracting agent for the city. This was part of the argument at a Memphis City Council meeting last month over the expansion of the Liberty Bowl Stadium. Black and council members expressed anger that minority accepted. contractors had not been included in the second largest city-funded construction project ever. Political observers say such protests were inevitable and should have been anticipated. Why even bring up the idea of expanding a public facility until you have that question resolved. But Memphis Mayor Dick Hackett says he did anticipate the conflict and talked to the contractors about the need to include minorities. He says some council members just use race to create division. It's too bad that it comes up as often as it does, but it, it is uh, the same people bringing it up. There was plenty of time that they could have picked up the phone, dropped by the office, written a letter, and expressed themselves. They did not express themselves until the night of the vote. We never heard the first word from any of the council members that brought up that issue in regards to the preparation of bidding that job. While both sides blame the other, the fact is that a bitter and public racial argument resulted. Political consultant John Bakke says the polarization extends beyond City Hall. I do know that at the present time that the racial voting patterns are the most extreme since any time that I've come to Memphis, and that's been 20 years. Bakke sees the trend toward racial voting continuing in part because most of our local elections are nonpartisan. That means that nobody runs as a Republican or as a Democrat. And oftentimes, nobody runs uh, with a significant platform or even philosophy. The two most significant bases that people in this area have to vote upon, on the one hand is personality, and the other is race. Within 10 years, Bakke says Memphis will have a black mayor, and that will result in an increase in white flight from the city. I have never heard one person say that if we elected a black mayor in Memphis, they would leave Memphis. Debbie Shatt is a Memphis native who lives in an affluent East Memphis neighborhood. I have heard some grumbles before about the inevitability of this happening. And white people do grumble about things like this because it threatens what they're used to. You know, white people in Memphis are used to um, being the power base. Whites have been used to power because until very recently in Memphis, they have been the majority. Population figures show that whites are continuing to flee the city for the suburbs. It's a trend that's happening across the nation. And some political observers say that Memphis is handling the upheaval better than many other communities. And it, it, it bothers me that, that we are held up to be more polarized. Again, I go back to the premise that we talk about it more. And that's good. I would much prefer that racial contentions be aired openly so we can put it on the table, call each other names, 
if need be, and come up with a solution and get it behind us so that we don't keep playing with these hidden agendas. So to some extent, the degree to which race can dominate our political scene is a natural symptom of a community that is in the middle of a major change in its racial makeup. But to others, the racial bickering is paralyzing and very damaging. The one solution that most experts seem to point to is new leadership that could unite both the black and white communities. As to where this new leadership is going to come from, well, most political experts say they're not sure about that. Well, you talked about whites leaving the city of Memphis. Where are they going out in the county of Charlotte, Germantown, the suburban cities? Well, exactly. The population figures show that whites are leaving and that they are going out into the county. The white population just in the county has tripled in the past 30 years. And during that time, interestingly enough, the black population just in the county has declined from about 30,000 in 1950 to under 10,000 in 1987. Startling figures, very, very much of a contrast. So what about tomorrow night? The series concludes tomorrow night. What is the concluding segment going to be on? The concluding segment is going to be on the future. We're going to be looking at how a lot of the people that we have talked to feel what the future is going to be for Memphis and right, Shelby I'll, County. I hope everybody feels good about it, too. Thank you very much, Esme. Claudia? For the past two weeks, Eyewitness News has been examining how Mid-Southerners feel about race relations. Tonight, reporters Bob Allen and Esme Murphy conclude their series, A House Still Divided, with a look at what the future holds for race relations here in Memphis. For the past two weeks, we have talked to prominent people in our community. We have also talked with those who are less well-known. We have found deep divisions. We have also found common ground. Tonight in our final segment, we explore the road to the future and what it will take to make Memphis truly a city of good abode. Free at last! Free at last! Thank God Almighty! Free at last. Will Dr. Martin Luther King's dream ever come true in Memphis? In a city known for racial polarization, there are blacks and whites who are hoping the dream becomes a reality in the future. I hope that when my son grows up in this community, you know, and I hope he stays here because it's a great place to live, he grows up looking at people for what they're worth, you know what I'm saying? The qualities that are inside of them, you know, uh, that go beyond whether they're black or white or whatever. Give them a little chance. That it's going to get much, much better than what it is. But what will we have to do to create racial harmony? There are those who say if the city keeps moving in its current direction, problems will only get worse. Middle class to affluent people are moving out of the city. Well, this is going to take a lot of tax money out of the city. And that's going to take money out of the police department. It's going to take money out of the schools. It's going to take money out of uh, street and repair and uh, will have to result in some decline in the quality of life within the city. But other Memphians have more confidence in their city. I would like to believe that there are enough people in this city who care about this community, care about its destiny, that they can come together and say, hey, we are going to engage in a systematic planning to make Memphis a viable community and not allow it to become uh, just a wasteland. If Memphis is to become a more progressive city, it will have to address the problems of its thousands of poor and working poor. There are whites who agree that the black community is not getting a share of the economic pie. When over 50% of your population is not in the loop, the business loop of business, it is really debilitating and will weaken the, the, uh, the, uh, the possibility of of uh, future uh, economic prosperity. Mayor Dick Hackett says his plan for minority business development could be a solution. We want to encourage them to join us in making something happen, creating the opportunities for the black business leaders in this city uh, to have a piece of the pie. And I intend to, to do everything I can within my legal authority to do that. I think black people in this city uh, have been excluded from arenas of power especially in the economic area. NAACP Executive Director Benjamin Hook says blacks and whites must come together in all arenas. And we, I don't think we've had a pulling together of a black and white academic, religious, uh, business, and government community to try to make this a better city. 
There is no doubt that blacks and whites have made significant progress in the last 20 years. There are more integrated neighborhoods and schools, and the races are slowly coming together socially. But there are issues that will not be resolved until we have better communication. This polarization of the races is bad for the black man and the white man, and it behooves us both even if we didn't have love to work together. So we see that our community is one that is at the crossroads. We are poised at a point that could lead to further division or that could bring us together to work for common goals. Ours is still a house divided. The choice is ours if it will stay that way. You know, I notice that so many of the series segments are focused on economics. Is that the key to bringing the races together? Uh, we think so, Claudia, because in, in so many ways, uh, economics is at the root of a lot of problems such as crime, substandard housing, and teenage pregnancy. It would seem that if there were more decent paying jobs, there wouldn't be such a difference between the haves and the have-nots. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Bob. It's a good job. Excellent Thanks very job. much. Moving toward the series. Well, part